Um, I'll take off uh, from where Dominic spoke to thank you once again for the invitation and uh, generally to thank the Macular Disease Society for providing uh, support uh, for all the patients who are waiting for us to plod along with treatments. Um, I am here to talk about the artificial retina and I'll start by saying at the moment, despite all the things I'll say, it's not currently aimed at macular disease, though most people here will clearly be able to extrapolate that one day we hope it may be able to. I recently spoke at the RP Society, and retinitis pigmentosa is a condition that in its worst form causes total blindness, uh, and of course it's relevant for that group. And the title of my talk there was The Artificial Retina Trial. And what's interesting for the first time is to that group, of course, they've always heard about research, promising research, research is coming up, research just around the corner. But in fact, in the artificial retina, that trial finished, and amazingly, in April of 2011, the artificial retina was regulated in Europe and available, and was a treatment option for severe blindness in retinitis pigmentosa. So a transition had happened, and sort of they'd missed it, uh, and there's a reason, and I'll come to that. But nonetheless, for us, it's an exciting moment that a long-awaited technology, a long-awaited research actually delivered a device that had fulfilled regulatory purposes, was safe, and felt to give some benefit to patients such that it was available for use. Uh, that device is the Argus II retina, uh, a retina de developed in the United States. There are other ones coming along the way. There's a trial of a German device, uh, a trial carried out in uh, Oxford and London as well. But I'll, I'll focus on this, the, the one I'm, I've been involved with. I was involved with a trial that allowed that regulation to give you some idea of where we are with these devices. But I do feel that it's an extraordinary moment that the research has finished, at least in one area, incredibly high-tech area, but an area that has now allowed a certain small subgroup of people with total blindness to get some vision back. To give you an idea of what that device is, people want to know what, what is it, what it's like, uh, it, can, it has three components. One is a video camera, which everyone's familiar with. That video camera is mounted on a pair of glasses, and that pair of glasses is totally separate from the eye or anything like that. You can take it off, put it in the cupboard, and forget about it. That pair of video glasses is attached to a small computer, and that computer is just a little bit bigger than a, uh, a pack of cigarettes, and that computer sits on a small uh, clip on your belt. And those, that's the external component. And once again, that computer is in no way attached to the eye. Inside the eye, there's an electronic panel which has a whole lot of dots. And there's 60 dots in a panel 10 by 6. And onto those dots is drawn whatever you see. And each of those dots carries an electrode, and it stimulates the residual retina in these people who are profoundly blind. And the two parts of the device, that is the external, the video glasses and the computer, send the signal to the device inside the eye wirelessly and also send the power wirelessly. So should the, should the person not want to use their device, they take it off, put it in the cupboard, and they look completely normal. When they want to use it, they put on a pair of glasses that looks like a pair of sunglasses, they clip the small uh, computer on their belt, turn it on, and then it starts sending the signals in real time going along. That's what it looks like, and that's how it works mechanically. Most people say that's fine. If the regulators have said it's safe and works, that'll be OK. But the real question is, what sort of vision does it give you, and what does it do for the patients who use it? That's what, of course, everyone's interested in. And the answer is it gives a very different type of vision than the one that they had lost or the ones that they would like. But nonetheless, it is vision in the sense that you perceive a visual stimulus. It consists of lights and it creates forms that match whatever you're looking for. The simplest example would be if someone with this device came in, they sat down, they put their device on, turned it on, and they looked at a screen, and on the screen we had drawn the letter T. They will look at the letter T, it's on a black background, it's a white T, there's nothing else to confuse them. In a sense, they describe, they will see, not floating in space, but in space, a glow in the shape of a T. The people who have very good outcomes see a very crisp T, like a neon T, and other people see vaguer forms of that. And they can relatively quickly identify it, and some people very quickly identify that it's a letter T. So the vision is formed, it's visual, so they don't have to use another sense to get it, 
but it's not of the quality of, or type that they were used to. There's ver variety in how good it is. So the best patients, and they're all people who have either bare perception of light, so the only sort of vision they have is that you can notice a bright light going on and off, and that's it, or they have no perception of light. These are very profoundly uh, blind people. Um, the best of them can read letters on these screens down to one or two centimetres and read at a rate of five words per minute. The worst of them just has enhanced light perception. So they can walk into a room and, and point quickly and say, that's the window, that's the door, there's a dark form sitting there, it's probably a person, and if someone walks past them, then they know the light has changed. So there's quite a variety. But what we're interested in, of course, is the people at the very good end, the, the group that have surpassed anything we might have hoped for with this first device, and that is people who walk in with either a guide dog or a cane, without those need help in everything, and yet they sit down, turn on the device, and will slowly but surely start reading words on a screen. For us, this is a major step, not because it'll immediately transform into everyone getting one and, and doing this, not that we fully understand why these people have done better, but that it's actually happening. And it's happening with a safe device that the regulatory bodies, which are, tend to be, and correctly so, strict, um, have given permission to, do, to go ahead with. Now you might say, how come we've not heard about this? And the answer lies a little bit in the politics, and I don't want to, 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 to dwell on it, but it's, it's real. So if it was passed in April of 2011, how come I'm speaking in September of 2012 and no one's really heard about it? And it's because of the way uh, health is delivered in this country. Just to put in perspective, following the trial of which one third, that's 10 out of the 30 cases were done in the UK, seven at more fields under my unit. So the UK provided the biggest contribution to the trial and it was passed in, in April of that year. The German government, which didn't take part in the trial, and the Italian government, which didn't take part in the trial, allowed it to be available within certain restrictions immediately after that. And they've gone on to, to, to implant uh, six and five cases. Uh, France will give permission in December of this year, we, we understand, and next week I'll go to Washington for the final FDA panel meeting to look at uh, regulation in the United States. However, as you're all aware from the Lucentis days, the Bionic Eyes entered the NICE um, category of devices and is currently being reviewed. And of course these things go very slowly and for something which will make quite a benefit to some and a small group of people, uh, we feel that it's in a sense clogged up in a bureaucratic position. But that's just to give you an idea why you're not hearing that it's available and people are not offering it to people you may know who need it. It's because it's caught up in our own second stage regulatory program. Nonetheless, it doesn't detract from our excitement of where we're up to it. Um, I said at the beginning that this is not something that is available for macular disease, and then I go on to tell you that these people are reading small letters on a screen, and many of you would dearly like to read, and you say, well, that sounds like exactly what I would like to have. The reason I gave you the example on the screen is because it's such an artificial moment. We take away all distractors, we give very high contrast, we set them up, they're very close, and they read at a very slow rate. However, if you take that same person who's just read five letters a minute and put them in an environment like this, it's too complex. You can't map out on a 60 grid what's going on here, the multiple faces, the, the, um, the, the aisles and things like that. And so it's, it's hard to make it more complex. And the quality of the vision we're achieving in that in that state is still worse than any of you might have with your peripheral vision. So the quality of vision is poor unless you didn't have anything to start with. So it's a huge step forward in that sense, but at the moment we don't feel it'll contribute anything to someone who's got reasonable peripheral vision and certainly someone who's got some central vision. And therefore, therein lies the gap between what I'm describing and why it's not going to become immediately available for macular disease. Of course, the next question from everyone is, why don't you make it better? Because my camera's got 5,000 me megapixels and my phone was better last year, <laughs> etc. And to be perfectly frank, it's a good question, and of course it crosses our minds too, but the important step has been made. The reason we're excited is the hard bit is getting an interface that integrates safely and stably into the human body, and especially into a very delicate place like the retina. 
These patients I've described to you weren't done last week. They're out at four or five years. These things are working stably and reliably. Uh, the longest cases are out into their sixth year, and the Argus one out at eight years. So these are reliable, long-standing, and what we've got is our interface. We're encouraged that in all technological things, the technology side can move quite quickly relative to the biological technical interface. And for us, this breakthrough that we've got a device that is stable, that works, that we can demonstrate gives benefit to patients and is safe in the long term, which is of course what you need, you don't want something that lasts a week or two, uh, is an enormous step for us. And we feel now that the technological movement will be slower than your camera and phone, so I'm not promising Argus 5 next year. <laughs> Um, but we do feel it'll come, and we do feel the major step has been in generating these stable interfaces, showing it's possible, and showing that it benefits patients. Now, I can go on with anecdotes and bits and pieces, but I feel that questions are often more useful. They bring out people's concerns. They point out things I've forgotten. They subdue my excitement, usually. Uh, but I'll stop there. I'll say it's a, it's a great time to be in research. I know for all of you it's far too slow. I'm very lucky to have been to be involved with two fabulous projects, both the Bionic Eye uh, and the Stem Cell Project with Pete Coffey. Uh, and it's a fantastic time for retinal research, ably supported by groups like your own, as well as, and we have to give them credit, uh, the government as well has funded very well uh, the infrastructure and uh, support for our site at Moorfields. Thank you very much. Thank you.